Dr. John Lennox is professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and emeritus fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science at Green Templeton College, Oxford. He is also an associate fellow of the said business school, Oxford University, and teaches for the Oxford Strategic Leadership Program. In addition, he is an adjunct lecturer at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford University, and the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, as well as being a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. He has lectured extensively in North America, Eastern and Western Europe, and Australia on mathematics, the philosophy of science, and the intellectual defense of Christianity. He has written a number of books on the interface between science, philosophy, and theology. Furthermore, in addition to over 70 published mathematical papers, he is a co-author of two research-level texts in algebra in the Oxford Mathematical Monographs series. His hobbies are languages, amateur astronomy, amateur bird watching, and some walking. John is married to Sally. They have three grown-up children and seven grandchildren and live near Oxford. Would you give Dr. John Lennox a great GC welcome this morning? Well, good morning, everybody. Shall we try again? Good morning, everybody. That's much better. This is a very unusual university. It's the first university in the world I have ever been at that has an antelope reception center. <laughs> so I don't know what you're doing with the antelopes, but I'm certainly not one. <laughs> now, it's an honor to be invited to speak to you. And I'm going to talk to you about the topic that is vitally important. Why do we believe that this world is not the only world? The great debate in our contemporary society in the West is between naturalism on the one side and supernaturalism on the other side. When I was at Cambridge many years ago, I used to listen to the late C.S. Lewis, who was qualified as a thoroughgoing supernaturalist. And he's one of those authors who, through many generations of students, has helped many of us to think in terms of the reality of the supernatural. And I want to concentrate on an event that changed the lives of three of the disciples totally and completely. It is the Apostle Peter who describes the event in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 where he says this, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter's writing this as an old man. And as you see, I'm an old man. So I'm going to take Peter's part, so to speak, and emphasize the things he was talking about to younger people. He said, I am about to make my departure from this world. Not I'm about to die. I'm about to go out. I'm about to make my exodus. There is another world. And I want you to know that the most important thing in your lives is to invest in that other world. Now, you'd be a fool to invest in something that you didn't know was real. And so the question is, Peter, what convinced you that the eternal world is real? And here he says it, that he was with Jesus and two other disciples when something very special happened that convinced him of two things. It convinced him of the power and the coming of Jesus Christ. That's two things, not one. He saw that there was a future, that death was not the end. And indeed, he was looking towards the future that all Christians share in common. The fact that Christ will literally and physically return. 
And I believe that as a scientist. I haven't time to argue it for you, but I would like to just tell you that science has nothing to say about it at all. The crucial assumption of naturalism is that this world is a closed system of cause and effect. It is not. There was a creation. There was a resurrection, and there shall be a second coming of Christ. What convinced them? Well, he refers to the event that we often call the transfiguration. And when Peter looks back on it, that day they were up the mountain with Jesus. Something happened that marked him for life. Down the bottom of the mountain, they didn't believe Jesus' claims. And Peter had said, when the Lord announced the crucifixion, this will never happen to you. And the Lord said, it's going to happen, and that made it much more difficult for people. And so, he said to them to answer their fears. He said, some of you standing here shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That is repeated three times in the Gospels. And in each occasion, it's followed by a statement that, and after three days, Jesus took them up a high mountain and was transfigured before them. I don't know whether it was in the daytime or at night, but what is very clear is something happened to the physical person of Jesus that his face began to shine like the sun. And that was very dramatic. You see, the sun in the sky is the source of all our energy and light and power. If it were to go out eight and a half minutes later, we'd soon begin to feel the effect, and very rapidly all life would extinguish. On the earth, Jesus was rejected, but they discovered that above this earth, so to speak, there is a world where Jesus is the sun, S-U-N, where he is the source of all light and energy and power and is the center of that world. Have you discovered it yet? And if you've discovered it, does it mean anything to you as you study in this university? Because that world is the eternal world. That world is the permanent world. This world is not permanent. So we're heading towards a world in which Jesus is its center and sun. But there's more to it than that. Peter was convinced by this event of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we mean by power? Well, we've got power, scientific and technological achievement to send people to the moon to blow up the planet. What does God think of power? And it's Mark who adds this bit. He says that Jesus' garments began to shine white, and then he puts it in an almost humorous way. Let me put it in modern English. Such as no laundry on earth has the power to whiten them. That's exactly what the text says. In other words, God says, do you want to know what power is? Just look at the whiteness of this man's garments. You don't get that on earth. What is power concerned with? It's concerned with moral purity and integrity. And each of us in this room knows what stains our characters and turns them black. It's not joy that does that. It's not God that does that. It's sin that does that. And real power is the control of our tempers, the control of what we watch on the internet, the control of what we think and what we say. That's real power. And God showed them up the mountain, what real power does. Now, let's be careful to understand exactly what's going on here. What Jesus said to these men was, there are some of you who are standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. You see, the moment you die, you'll be utterly convinced of the reality of the kingdom and government of God. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, how can we be convinced of it before we die? 
The only way we're going to live effectively for Christ if, is if we're convinced of the reality of that world before we die. Because death is going to be too late. And that's why Jesus said, there are some of you standing here who shall not taste of death. That is, you won't die in any sense whatsoever until you see the kingdom of God. And up on the top of that mountain, they saw a prefiguring of God's kingdom, first of all, in the shining of the face and the garments of the king. Have you seen that? Or does it still sound like a myth as it does to so many people who say these things are impossible? Power in changing the color of Christ's garments and showing that God is interested in righteousness in the way we live, in our attitudes. But there's more to it than that. Because suddenly they saw Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus. Now here's real power. And I'm interested in this as a scientist. Moses and Elijah lived centuries apart. Moses died. Elijah was carried, we're told, straight to heaven. Here's real power. Jesus made them contemporaries. It's fantastic, you know, when you think about it. The power of Christ. You know, I love my father. I had a wonderful father and mother. Christians, they're gone to glory. I'll meet them one day. What age will they be, do you think? What age will your friends be? Well, we don't know. But the incredible power of Christ shown on that mountain is he can make people contemporary who lived centuries apart. Do you think he's going to be able to do it again? Well, of course he is, on the big scale. Because what you're seeing here is a preview of God's kingdom. Just a little bit of what's going to happen. And they were having a discussion. And poor old Peter and James and John, they went to sleep when the thing was going on. They were overwhelmed with it. It blew all the circuits of their physical system. And then they suddenly woke up and Peter says, Lord, Let's put up three tents, or four tents up here, for uh, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. Three tents. Uh, and, of course, he hadn't heard the conversation. Because Luke now tells us that they'd been discussing the Lord's exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, if you wanted to arrange a conference on exodus, who would you invite as main speakers? Well, I think I'd have Moses and Elijah for a start because Moses led the biggest exodus known in history and Elijah made an exodus without dying. Moses died, Elijah didn't. Those are the only two ways, by the way, of going into the other world. But they weren't discussing Moses' exodus. They weren't discussing Christ, uh, Elijah's exodus. They were discussing Christ's exodus. This is a description of the cross the exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. But it's not looking at the cross as the end, but as a door opening into that other world. And they were discussing the way he would go. And then they came down the mountain. The vision remains a vision if it's not made a reality, you know. And so they came down the mountain. And you will recall as they came down the mountain that they met a distraught father. And he had a boy who kept falling into the fire, couldn't control himself and all this kind of thing. And he came to Jesus and he said, well, I brought them to your disciples. And the disciples said, literally, we didn't have the power to help him. And Jesus said, what do you mean didn't have the power? All things are within the power of him who believes. You see, he's talking about the topic of power. Power up the mountain. When they saw our Lord's face change, his clothes change, and heard this incredible voice, this is my son. But now down the mountain, the disciples didn't have the power. We often find ourselves like that. And Jesus said, all things are within the power of him who believes. Bring him to me. But there's something deeply poignant here that I want you to grasp. On top of the mountain, God spoke. 
As Moses and Elijah disappeared and Christ was left alone, God spoke and says, this is my son. Listen to him. I want you all to remember this day. If ever you are going to make an effect in the world for God, your number one priority is to listen to him. This world is full of voices and noise and music to such an extent that people can't get away from the internet or their iPads and their iPhones. How much time do you spend listening to God? You can answer that very readily. Just go out after this lecture and work out quickly how much time you spend watching a screen that's got nothing to do with your studies. And then you know how much time you've got. It's so easy, even at a Christian university, to play at religion instead of getting to know God through his word and listening to him. And that was the message on top of the mountain, and the message down the mountain was the man came to Christ with his son and said, look at my son. Up the mountain, listen to my son. Down the mountain, look at my son. And perhaps you felt it, have you? Lord, look at my mom, look at my dad, look at my brother. Some of you are broken hearted because you have a living faith in Christ and some of your friends and relatives don't. And you come constantly to the Lord and say, Lord, look at my friend. We live in a broken world, don't we? And the Lord is prepared for us to bring our friends to him. Even when they're distorted by the misuse of narcotics and their minds are deranged by endless listening to stuff that they cannot begin to process information-wise. Brains battered and bashed. That's what we're doing, of course, to ourselves. But the Lord is prepared to look at us. This is big stuff, isn't it? But it's, it's real. And when I was asked to speak this morning, I thought, I'm going to say something that I heard when I was your age. And it changed my life because I realized that there is another world and Christ is the evidence of it. He is the sun, he's the light, he's the energy. And listening to him, I haven't done it perfectly, but I spent my life trying to listen and to hear and it has enriched my life. Don't sell your lives for anything less, young people. God has made you as his creatures of infinite value made in his image. But there's something bigger. There's your value if you trusted Christ as Savior and are now one of his children. He values you with his life. And he's going to give you an eternity. How vastly important that is going to be. Now there's a lot more, but Let's look at just a little bit. What Peter says is this. We were with him in the holy mountain, but we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You weren't there, and I wasn't there. So how can we be sure? And Peter realizes we won't, weren't there. And he says, we have, and probably the correct translation is, we have the more sure word of prophecy. That is, Scripture is more certain than subjective psychological experience. Of course, the experience confirms Scripture, so being an Irishman, I want to interpret it both ways around. What can make you sure of the reality of the world to come? I, I believe that what Peter is saying here is that the transfiguration 
played a role for Peter which the Scriptures can perform for you. Getting into Scripture. Many years ago, I ran a Bible study in Oxford for about 50 people, three hours on a Sunday and sometimes three hours on a Wednesday. Because I could see that the education system was very good at the professional side and people learned very rapidly, but they didn't develop their knowledge of God at that speed. And so when they got out into the world and somebody questioned their worldview, they had nothing to say. And they kept their mouths shut forever afterwards. That's happening all the time and you must know it. We live in a politically correct society that wants you not to speak of your faith in Christ. And you won't do it unless you understand it and break through the fear barrier and the shame barrier. How did Peter do it? Well, one of the ways was his experience with Christ, but the second one he mentions here is Scripture is something we should pay attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is beautiful poetry, but what does it mean? It means simply this, that we study Scripture not to prepare sermons, not to prepare Bible studies, not to prepare Sunday school classes only. We study it to get to know God. And let me tell you, that's the first thing to slip. I know many people who've been spending their lives in, in Bible teaching and all of this, but all of it, or most of it, is geared to others. The first thing that we let slip is studying Scripture to get to know God. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. In that Bible study, there was a young man who was destined to be one of the Europe's most powerful evangelists. He led thousands of young people to Christ, and we agreed that the first one to die, the other one would preach the sermon. And I was older than he, so he expected me to die first. But I didn't. And I'll never forget the day he told me he had incurable cancer. And I had to preach. And I said, Nigel, what will I say to them? And without hesitation, he said this. He said, tell them, John, to do what we did when we were students. To wait on God and get into his word and wait until the face of God appears. And then he said, and then they'll have something to say. Do you want of something to say, young people? As you go out into the world, do you want of something to say? Well, if you want of something to say, there's only one way to get it. And that is to spend that time that masses of time that goes into the internet, goes into taking photographs of your breakfast and sending them to your worst friends. <laughs> well, you do, don't you? You know, I'm an, old, I'm an old guy. In my world, the only thing that tweeted were birds. <laughs> now it's bird brains. No, I'm all for the social media. They publicize things. But don't let them dominate you. Because what will happen is your time will be eroded. And that special time of getting into Scripture and prayer and getting to know it and taking it as seriously as you do your own academic subjects. If you're going to have something to say, you're not going to get it from the Internet, folks. You're not going to mug it up half an hour before you give that little talk. You've got to get to know God. And you know, that echoes in my mind from my friend. You see, the reason that happens is explained here. Peter says, no scripture, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. What he means by that is, you don't invent scripture by sheer intellectual power. It's the revelation of God. And until we're convinced of that, we'll be treating scripture as less than a book rather than as more than a book. And it's wonderful, you know, he says this, if we pay attention to it, something's going to happen to us. He says, you pay attention to Scripture like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 
The morning star is coming, literally and physically. Jesus Christ will one day come over the horizon of this world. The morning star will come, but something can happen to you before that. You can be so convinced in your heart, in your experience, of the reality of that that you sense the morning star rising in your heart. That's what Scripture is meant to do. It's meant to give you an immediate and real experience of that eternal world. As I said before, this is big stuff. This is the stuff of reality. And we will be tested on whether it's real to us or not. But let's avoid any playing at religion. When I was your age, I saw very logically that if Christianity is true, then you stand for it. If it's not, you forget it. And I resolved to stand for it publicly. And in my university, I was 19 years old and I was at a dinner. And sitting beside me was a Nobel Prize winner. And I tried pretty feebly to talk about my faith in God. And at the end of the dinner in Cambridge, he invited three professors plus me to his room. He sat me down. They all stood around me. And he said, Lennox, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, right, in front of witnesses today, you give up this childish notion of God. I tell you, that was pressure. But God gave me the courage to say, and what would you offer me that's better than what I've got? And he came out with some Bergsonian evolutionism that most of you have probably never heard of. And I said to him, sir, I'll take the risk. I'll stick with what I've got. But I never forgot it. I never forgot it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be talking about science on Thursday night. But let me just say one thing as I now close. The greatest pressure coming from the top of the scientific world is that you've got to choose between science and God. That is logical absurdity. It's like saying you've got to choose between Henry Ford and the law of internal combustion to explain a motor car. That's how stupid and trivial it is. <laughs> and when Stephen Hawking was asked what he thought of religion, he said, religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. My response is this, ladies and gentlemen. Atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. It's been an honor to talk to you. But I really pray that there are young people out of this room who are going to say, I'm going to give my life to the defense of Christianity. Get yourself the best jobs you can. Maximize your potential. Be credible in the world. But seek first God's kingdom and everything else will be added. Don't wait until you become the CEO until you start witnessing. Don't wait until you've got tenure before you start getting this message into society. Start right now. Engage with the world. Overcome the fear. Because he who is with you is much greater than he who is in the world. God bless you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do praise you for the power of your word its analysis of the situation in which we find ourselves and the wonder of your revelation in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the one who has come into our world as the word become flesh and has made his exodus through the cross, the resurrection and the ascension and who asks us to follow him to that other world and blaze a trail in this world that shows people that the other world is real. Deliver us from internal hypocrisy. Save us from being idiotic in our attitude to technology. 
Help us, Lord, to set priorities to which we stick. And we thank you for this great university. We praise you that such a university exists based on Christian principles. And we pray for the faculty and the administration who seek to run this university as intellectually credible and a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. So we thank you for our time together. Bless all these students, Lord, with all the difficulties and secret problems that many face. And we pray that each of us might have a sense of your love and forgiveness and your empowerment and give us the courage to live for Jesus Christ our Lord, who soon will come. For his glorious sake, amen. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. Uh, he will be speaking at 2 p.m. here in the arena and doing a book signing immediately following. Thank you. Have a great week.